morning. Um, on behalf of the representation of the European Commission in Austria, I would like to warmly welcome you to this seminar ahead of the elections in Greece. Kalimera and big thanks to our speakers in Brussels, Essence and Thessaloniki, Alexandra Vuduri, Angeliki Dimitriadi and George Sirkas for being with us and for providing us with a first hand insight into the topics that matter in the context of the elections. This seminar is part of a cooperation project between the Commission and the Forum for Journalism and Media, FUM. And as usual, I would like to thank Miana Tomic from the FUM for having organized this event and for having brought us together. We are well aware that uh, these days um, many people, many journalists look east of Greece to Turkey, but still we thought it's very important to discuss also the situation in Greece and understand what is going on on the ground. Um, for those of you who are especially interested in the economic situation of Greece, I would like to highlight that today, this morning, the European Commission is presenting its spring forecast, which will have a detailed country chapter on Greece. And I will post my email address in the chat. So if you're interested, please just drop me an email and I'll forward you the detailed documents. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to Mejana. Many thanks again for being with us today and have an interesting morning. Good morning. <laughs> Thank you so much, Sabine. Good morning to everybody, to our conversation on the elections in Greece between economic uh, concerns and the rule of law. My name is, since we have some new uh, participants, my name is Mirjana Tomic. I'm a former journalist, and now I organize and moderate seminars on media and politics in Europe, uh, customized for journalists and uh, academic researchers. Just uh, as an introduction for those who uh, do not know us yet, uh, all of my events focus on understanding the local context and are customized for, as I said, media and academia. Also, the objective is to build the network of uh, academics and uh, uh, journalists who can help each other understand different European um, realities. All eyes focus on Turkey today, but Greek elections are just as important. Uh, COVID-19 and the war in Ukraine have pushed Greece out of the headlines, but new and old problems have not disappeared. To talk about the three topics, and uh, uh, we shall talk about three topics and uh, explore uh, three different aspects of the elections. So one is the uh, what matters to the Greek voters. When I was uh, talking to George, uh, our speaker, uh, who is a, uh, who is assistant professor of political behavior at the Department of Political Science at the uh, Democritus University in Thrace, one thing, uh, uh, and research director of public opinion uh, 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 at the University of Macedonia, um, one thing came to, uh, uh, caught my attention, and that is when he said. Uh, international or European colleagues think that one sort of things are important for Greece and Greek voters think that other uh, things are important for Greeks. Which brings me to the second uh, topic that is uh, foreign policy uh, and to what extent the election results uh, 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 will affect or not affect uh, foreign policy. We have seen uh, right now what is, uh, you know, how the situation is evolving in Turkey and that there was a lot of wishful thinking in part uh, on the Western uh, countries that there would be one, uh, one election result and it seems it won't be or, uh, or it will be disputed. And the third topic that uh, I would like to address, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Alexandra Boldori, research fellow at the prestigious Athens-based Elia Med think tank, will um, address foreign affairs, and she's currently correspondent of the Daily Katemerini in Brussels. And migration, what is happening with migration? Uh, uh, we were seeing these horrid pictures, only uh, images several months ago, a year ago. What happens now? Uh, Angeliki Dimitriadi, she's an expert on migration and will explain to us the current situation, but also 
do Greek uh, parties really differ how they uh, address uh, how they address the, uh, the topic of uh, migration? Migration has not disappeared. As I said, the fact that topics are not and uh, 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 the headlines of the mainstream European or US media doesn't mean that problems disappear. And just one uh, comment about format. It will be a combination of conversation and uh, presentations. And then we shall have a live questions. Uh, I, I, I invite you to ask uh, questions. So there will be plenty of question time. And we shall record this event, and then we shall also distribute it over YouTube for journalists who are uh, who will be covering the uh, elections in Greece. So uh, I would like to uh, start with uh, Alexandra. Alexandra, did you sleep last night? And how do you see that the uh, the possible results of the elections in Turkey uh, could affect? Uh, uh, or not affect uh, 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 how Greece perceives its uh, elect, uh, its relations with uh, uh, Turkey, and also could, in any way, the results of the elections affect uh, Greek foreign policy. Alexandra, please. Well, uh, good morning from me. Uh, thank you, Mariana, for uh, this uh, opportunity to talk about um, elections in Greece, and it's. There's some different scenarios regarding uh, foreign policy, as you can uh, assume, uh, not only me, not only journalists, but also uh, politicians in Greece were following uh, the election results yesterday, um, because um, either we want it or not, um, the results in Turkish elections will definitely uh, affect the course of Greek-Turkish relations. Uh, at the moment, um, I could say that the two countries are enjoying, let's say, over the last couple of months, a period of calm uh, in their relations. The February 6 earthquakes uh, in Turkey put an end to, um, let's say, to the aggressive rhetoric and direct threats by Turkish officials against Greece. And tension uh, over the Aegean also dropped significantly due to a reduction in Turkish overflights to virtually zero in areas uh, Greece considers part of its territory. And both sides claim that this has created a significant opportunity for bilateral relations. And many uh, Western capitals also assume that following the elections in both uh, countries, respectively, uh, that um, the two new governments will sit at the table and finally resume talks that may lead to a final resolution of uh, differences between Greece and Turkey. However, this is a very optimistic uh, uh, view um, because um, uh, political will is always needed in, from both sides, it takes two to tango, and I'm not sure uh, how uh, the different scenarios in uh, both countries will help uh, these talks and how these talks will evolve. But, um, Turkey will definitely uh, continue to be uh, number one, uh, a top priority uh, in Greece's foreign policy, whatever the outcome will be in both uh, countries, respectively. Interestingly, Miriana, in the only televised debate um, among the six main political leaders last week, we didn't uh, hear any vision or um, a strategy or let's say, clear lines on behalf of neither of the six political leaders regarding foreign policy in general or vis-a-vis -vis, um, Greek-Turkish relations. Maybe the questions that were posed by journalists didn't help them describe uh, their strategies or visions. Um, and the only interesting thing, it was that their talks focused on migration but um, in, uh, in a very wrong way, and may, uh, Agiliki, Dr. Agiliki Dimitriati may explain why. Um, all parties, with no exception, stood in favor of further protection of borders, and especially those uh, that we share with Turkey. This is a very interesting element. And we haven't heard anything about the war in Ukraine during the pre-elections campaign. This is also very interesting because the war in Ukraine affects us all. And I'm not sure whether, and uh, Professor Siakas may also elaborate 
this, why there are no questions in op opinion polls about the war in Ukraine and how Greek citizens feel and whether there is an impact on their everyday li uh, life, uh, especially when we know that if uh, there is a change, let's say, uh, um, in, in the government in Greece, uh, in a scenario, let's say, um, that Syriza with uh, central left PASOK or the extreme um, left META, uh, it was dependent on META 25, uh, form a coalition, we do know that at least um, in the, in the, on the issue of the war in Ukraine, they will change uh, the, the line of the current New Democracy government. Um, they will continue to support and be aligned with uh, EU's decision regarding humanita humanitarian aid, but uh, people familiar to Syriza's, um, let's say, uh, foreign policy strategy uh, have confirmed to me that um, this government will stop sending uh, ammunition and armaments to Ukraine, which will make uh, a difference. So. Um, there is a lack of interest uh, over the war in Ukraine, and not even the European Union has stopped the agenda of this pre-election campaign. It's not the first time that we don't talk about uh, Europe, but uh, it, it is interesting that we don't talk about Europe in a critical moment that Europe is currently facing, and it's in a phase of transforming itself, <clears throat> and the debate over several issues like um, strategic autonomy or our relations with the United States and China, I mean, the EU relations with the uh, United States and China are on the table uh, in many European uh, capitals. Also, other issues like uh, the majority, the qualified majority voting, which is a sensitive issue to Greek, Greece's foreign policy as well, is not even that debated. Um, and uh, as you can assume, uh, Greece's foreign policy is uh, Turkey-oriented, but yet again, we don't talk about EU-Turkey relations, for instance. Um, as far as Greek-Turkey relations are concerned, as I said at the beginning, uh, what are the hopes and, uh, let's say, the prospects of the European capitals and uh, in Athens? They believe that uh, after the elections in both countries, there will be certain pressure for both sides to sit at the table and finally discuss about issues that separate us for over half a century now. Uh, thank you so much. I just have uh, two uh, uh, brief questions. Uh, uh, among others, because you are the only journalist uh, among the, uh, the speakers. Uh, well, uh, when we spoke before this event, you said that uh, you had the impression that Greek uh, politicians prefer to have Erdogan as a, as a partner in Ankara because they know him. That's uh, one thing. And the other thing is, uh, you said that uh, at, this, uh, uh, at this debate on Greek TV, uh, there, were no, there was no discussion about uh, foreign news or the war in Ukraine. Uh, I'm just wondering, does, is it also a reflection on how Greek media cover this, uh, the war, or do they cover it at all? Or, uh, or it is something that is unrelated to what happens in the media space? Um, let, let me, thank you for the question, uh, Mirjana. Um, and let me start with the war in Ukraine. Well, there is a space, obviously, in the Greek media, but not as much as uh, is in the European media. I mean- Greece is Europe, by the way. Greece is Europe. Greece is, has been a member state for over 30 years now, and uh, the war in Ukraine affects us all uh, in many and mul multiple ways. Um, but there are not uh, many analyses on what is going on uh, in Ukraine. Um, the journalists just focus on what is going on day to day, but not they don't give too much space, let's say, to uh, the prospects and how this war could evolve. We don't read the analysis, let's say, in the Greek media that we usually or often read in the foreign press. And there is a different angle. And uh, let's say there is no, I wouldn't say that there is indifference, there, there is interest, but not um, much space is given to the war uh, in Ukraine. And um, 
that also explains why there are no uh, questions in opinion polls about uh, the war in Ukraine. Uh, that could have made a difference because in the polls that we had, at least uh, back in 2022, uh, there were a mixture of, um, um, let's say, stance of the Greek citizens towards the war. And uh, you know, and I know that uh, we had traditionally good relations with Russia, and that has certainly shaken up things, and we see differently Russia now and Putin. Um, now, as far as um, who the Greek political establishment would like to see as winner uh, in Ankara, that's very interesting because it seems that the diplomatic establishment, I mean, the establishment of diplomats and uh, at the foreign ministry uh, wanted, um, they say, let's say, let me make, frame it diplomatically, that a win of Erdogan might be in the interest of Greece. Um, there is a school of thought in Greece, there has always been a school of thought in Greece that believes uh, uh, things should stay as they are, because, uh, as I mentioned before, there will be a heavy political cost for any government that will decide openly, frankly, honestly, sit at the table and um, discuss with Turkey the issues. Uh, well, they do discuss the issues. I mean, there, we have 63 rounds of uh, the so-called exploratory talks, but with no real progress, especially the last couple of years. What do I mean? Progress, an arbitration agreement, and a political will to refer to The Hague. That, as you can imagine, uh, will have a certain political cost. So there is a school of thought in Greece for many years that wants things to stay as they are. Uh, however, this is very short-sighted because we have seen that Turkey, Turkey's claims are um, being added year by year. I mean, uh, uh, Turkey even uh, now uh, is uh, demanding a demilitarization of the islands in the Aegean, and is putting other issues as well on the table that Greece does not recognize um, as issues that should be discussed. However, there are there. And uh, as you can see, this school of thought uh, wants things to, say, to stay the same, but it has effect and it has a cost uh, on Greece's foreign policy. And recently, we have seen a euphemism uh, in the public agenda, uh, calling for um, that they believe that if talks will resume, that might lead to uh, an Aegean precipice, meaning that we will have a heavy compromise uh, with Turkey that will certainly not be in the interest of Greece. However, <laughs> from the from the word prespa, uh, you can see how irrelevant and short-sighted this definition and this euphemism. Uh, is and um, one also interesting thing is that no one really knows who has introduced this misleading term in the public uh, agenda. Uh, there is the other school of thought, and I'm ending uh, here, that believes that a new uh, Helsinki strategy should be um, the case uh, after elections in both countries, but that certainly um, needs a different government in uh, Turkey. Uh, a government that will be West oriented and EU oriented. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Now, George, uh, what do Greeks care about? Uh, uh, not what we think uh, abroad that they care about. What do they really care about? And uh, <clears throat> what will, uh, which matters will, which topics will decide who they will uh, vote for? Go ahead, George. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. I hope I resolved the issue with the sound. If not, uh, please uh, let, let, let us tolerate that. Um, well, uh, thank you for the invitation, first and foremost, and I will try to put the things into, uh, into the following narrative. I will try to, to discuss about three main groups of actors that all are connected and uh, in their play uh, during the elections. Uh, these three groups are the is the public opinion, so it's the societal level, uh, are the political actors, let's say the parties, uh, the political uh, uh, protagonists, like the prime minister, the opposition leader, and uh, the other minor parties, 
And of course, uh, an actor that is very important to you and probably it's important to all of us, that lies somewhere in beneath the two levels of actors that are the media. So I will try to share some of the insights that uh, um, uh, cam came from uh, uh, opinion polling that uh, we, we conduct a lot. I will try to, to maximize the screen in order to see what, what, what is going on. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to point out that uh, talking about the elections in, in Greece means that we have to understand the context in Greece, what is going on. So the three main elements that we have to take always into consideration is that the Greek society is a society of low levels of trust, and that comes along with cynicism and apathy. When we're talking about cynicism, uh, please bear in mind that cynicism is when you have the response that everyone is the same, so nothing matters, uh, when you ask things about political efficacy. So cynicism, cynicism and apathy come along and come together with political inefficiency. So if you see here, you can, you can see here, this is from, um, from, an, from an opinion poll we, uh, we conducted for the IMED. IMED is an incubator for media in Greece. Uh, you can see here that we have extremely high levels of distrust in nearly all the major institutions. You can see that the, the main protagonist is, are the political parties, that you can see that we have, uh, uh, we, we have a percentage of 80%, eight, eight out of 10 people uh, distrust political parties. Uh, the same applies also to the Greek government, to the local government, to, to the media, the, the, the Media is the only only institution that competes head by head to the political parties. As you can see here, and this is of course a very disappointing uh, insight, but it's uh, it's reality, uh, unfortunately. As you can see here that all the main institutions that normally had to bring trust and had and and people should rely their hopes for a change or for political efficacy or change or or whatever you want to, to put forward for an agenda, you can see that they have very low levels of trust. And, it can, and this, in this, in the second slide, I can show you that this comes along also with the, the values regarding the participation in the elections. Uh, this is a, a recent uh, poll uh, in, uh, in April of 2023. When you discuss about elections, uh, five, uh, seven out of 10 respondents say that Elections are important because they determine the future of, of the country. Okay, we get it. This is a, this is a value-oriented question. But when you change the narrative, when you ask about democracy and how democracy functions in our country, then you can see that the results change a lot. And then uh, the 50%, five out of 10 respondents, claim that we have democracy in name and not in effect, not in reality. And there is also a 13%, one out of 10, that they're ready to prefer less democracy and more prosperity. And this, unfortunately, is a direct attack to the core of the democratic establishment, that the democracy is not equivalent to prosperity. And uh, if I may elaborate on that, the main problem and the main issue here is that democracy does not guarantee the perspectives of prosperity. And if you combine all of these, if you combine the high level of distrust, the high level of apathy, the high levels of cynicism, and the political inefficiency, this is a very dystopic uh, environment. Uh, now, let's, let's di discuss a bit about the main concerns uh, regarding public opinion. Uh, I, will, uh, I, I will take, take the lead from what Alexandra mentioned before. Actually, the war in Ukraine um, was present in public opinion polls until 2022. That, that, that's, that's a fact. And why we do not use the war in Ukraine anymore? Because the war in Ukraine is not present in the public agenda. We have crystallized what public opinion discussed about the war in Ukraine, but uh, we use that, as, we, we conceptualize the war in Ukraine as a stalemate and not something that goes on. Uh, if you consider about the consequences in daily life, if you uh, regard about the, um, the, the development in the front, 
uh, uh, in the public agenda, you can you can monitor, you can see that it's a, it's a matter of stalemate. You cannot see development, you cannot see progress in this uh, area. So yes, that's reality. We, uh, the the war in Ukraine has moved out of the public opinion public agenda, but the figures back in 20, 2022 were extremely aligned with the Western counterpart. And uh, I can say that uh, the war in Ukraine uh, was or is, uh, in, in order to better phrase it, one of the matters that the Greek public opinion is aligned with the Western, um, uh, with, with, the counter, with the member states in, uh, in the European Union. So let's see what, what, is the, uh, what matters for the public opinion. Uh, the response in uh, very high levels of, uh, uh, of uh, choice uh, is about economy. What matters is economy. You can see that in uh, the uh, in the question, what is the most important problem that you face today? Uh, economy and inflation and prices is about 50%. And if you add also unemployment, it's about 60%. Uh, the, uh, the corruption case uh, has... Uh, has low figures, and what usually happens to these kinds of questions when you leave the uh, spontaneous response uh, as a choice, you can also have a significant uh, large share of responses saying something else. Uh, this something else, I have, I have left that uh, in purpose because it does not says it doesn't say uh, a specific story. So uh, although it uh, it can it can look like having a large amount of people that say that there is something else. It's not something else as a concrete value. It's something completely else. So what matters today is economy in one, uh, in one phrase. Uh, for me, one of the most important insights that the public opinion polling say today is how much satisf what, what is the degree of satisfaction with the current government? Uh, you can see here that uh, uh, there is, there is a, let's say, a six, a six to four ratio. So uh, there, there are people that are satisfied with the government. These are 26%. People that are dissatisfied with the government, but they claim that there is no alternative. These, if you add that, is 60%, nearly 60%. And there are people that are dissatisfied with the government and claim that there is another, not, and that there is another alternative that is 41%. So this is a six to four ratio. Six, uh, six out of ten are ready to support the government because they are they are they are either satisfied or they think that there is no better alternative. And four out of ten are dissatisfied with the government and support for another alternative. The fact is that the six out of four, it's uh, it it already saves a majority. So before. Before going to the media and discussing more about your, uh, I think, the area of your uh, specific interest, I would like to point out two main issues and to bring out the, the other factor, the other actor that I have mentioned before, the political actors, the political parties and the uh, political protagonists. Um, in Greece, we have, I can, I can distinguish among three, three different narratives. The narrative of the government, the narrative of the government says that uh, the government can deliver, a uh, prime minister is a doer, and the main focus is the economy. That's the main narrative. The main narrative of the main opposition party, Syriza, that the main narrative is justice uh, to everyone and for everyone. So it's a matter of corruption. It mentions the wiretaps uh, issue and um, uh, what happened with the rule of law. It's something that is implied. We have, and we have the third narrative that is being supported by the minor parties. Uh, we have the anti-system parties, which are uh, the Varoufakis party and the Velopoulos party that are trying to, to provide an anti-system narrative that we can uh, um, attack the establishment or the system, of course, uh, from the inside. So we can, uh, uh, we can fight that, we can create new conditions for people and new prosperity conditions or uh, w whatever you can you can frame with this uh, uh, narrative. Uh, we have also the narrative uh, of uh, PASOK, that it is somewhere in between. It is justice and economy or another, or another let's say, uh, 
pro programmatic uh, declaration for for the future but it is very vague and uh, doesn't uh, create the conditions for uh, further support so if we combine all of this and we can if we can see also how the political demand uh, acts and uh, reacts to the political supply we can see that the main issue that concerns uh, greek public opinion is economy so uh, in order to to reply in one line uh, the issue of the rule of law and the conditions and what happened with all this scandal does not affect the pre-elections agenda and it, it is not in the agenda as you probably might think of it would have been and i directly connect that to the to the distrust and cynicism of the greek public opinion in other words uh, please bear in mind that if we, if we have reversed the question for example uh, what government did was, ex was a direct attack to the rule of law. But if we had the opposition, the current opposition in the place of the current government, would it have done the same? Unfortunately, the response combining all these insights would have been affirmative, that everyone does the same. So the rule of law and the attack to the rule of law is a systemic issue in Greece and not something that happened from the current government. So we leave aside this issue because it's a, it, it is a systemic failure and we uh, insist on issues that could uh, have not been systemic and could uh, change such the economy. I will go to the last, uh, to the last section of my intervention and I will be more than happy to discuss and to elaborate on this insight. And I would like to, to discuss briefly about the media. The problem in Greece is that media are part of this uh, environment of cynicism and apathy. Uh, media, and unfortunately also journalists, as part, as an inherent part of the systemic media structure, uh, are, uh, irreli are unreliable, have level, level of expertise, are tending to manipulate people, they have high levels of corruption, and are being censored. That's unfortunately uh, some of the insights. This is also uh, a survey we have conducted for IMET in, uh, uh, in 2022. This is a, an, extremely, um, an extremely bad image for the, um, for the media vendors and unfortunately also for the people that work in media. What this slide says and what these insights say about media is that uh, the, the public opinion consider media as a part of the establishment, as a part of the system. And what applies to the system as a whole apply also to the people that serve these, um, uh, these organizations. Uh, the last slide for me, for me uh, um, uh, concerns um, uh, four, uh, four, uh, four characteristics that media should serve or serve in, uh, uh, in, in all all over the other Europe, as uh, Miriana mentioned, that uh, we tend to say to distinguish uh, Greece uh, uh, from Europe. So I'm trying to be more aligned to the uh, to the lapses we we uh, rarely do. Uh, so um, we have low ratings on freedom, on independence from political power, and economic independence. Uh, these. I assume that you can affirm that these are preconditions for media to do their job properly. And these are preconditions of what, uh, not preconditions, this, this is the, uh, the, the, how the work should be done. Media should be free, should be independent, and should uh, control the power and also uh, try to reveal the truth in uh, an objective or if objectivity is, a, is an issue in a fair way. Let's say these uh, these attributes, these characteristics, have very low ratings in terms of um, in pa of, of uh, public opinion. Uh, in one line, in order to sum up and to uh, bring the discussion or uh, give the floor back to Miriana, in one line, these elections uh, are elections of low fly. The um, the ma the main uh, the main uh, fight among the parties is to bring back the voters that they, they got in 
back in 2019. So it's um it's a it's a it's a struggle for the alignment to get back the alignment of the voters that they they've trusted them. In this scenery, in the scenery of low trust, in the cynicism in the cynicism era and the apathy era, the main concerns of, of the parties is to, is to disseminate the rhetoric, to disseminate their, uh, their, their narrative into the broader audience possible, but um, in their own audience. They do not try to allure people in order to, uh, to, to bring a real change. They're, they're trying to allure the voters that they got back in 2019. This could be adequate for the uh, prime minister and for new democracy to win. And this is a, a real fight for the opposition to get, the, to get as much as it can. But unfortunately, the agenda does not support uh, a change uh, uh, this uh, time. That's for me. Thank you so much, George. Before, uh, well, <laughs> I wrote so many things down. Before I uh, give the words to uh, Giriki, I have a very simple question. Is Greece, uh, is Greece a democracy? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it is, yes. It is a democracy. It is a democracy. Uh, of course, this is a very tough question, uh, of for, especially for academics, in order to define democracy and also to, um, uh, to, to discuss about the main attributes and the most important attributes of a democracy. Uh, it's a democracy, yes. It has serious problems. And uh, if these problems won't be resolved, it would be in a, very, um, in, a, in a very bad position of sliding towards uh, uh, regimes that do not resemble democracy or are only democracy in space. Um, uh, but for the time being, yes, Greece is a democracy. It has second balances, it has problems, and it, it's not uh, as uh, it's not a functional democracy compared to the other member states, of course. Uh, but at, at this time being, yes, Greece is a democracy. Would it make a difference which party wins? Uh, how the system will evolve? Um, I'm afraid that. Uh, uh, well, the easy answer is to say no, it, it doesn't make any change. Uh, but due to the fact that uh, we have a polarized, uh, at least in the, uh, in the top level uh, uh, agenda in this issue, it will make a change because, uh, um, because other things are very hard to change. These things and uh, in terms of uh, how people behave, uh, what the cultural component, these are easier um, is, is, these are easier to, to change. So uh, uh, it could make some change. But at the time being, I do not expect any serious change in the upcoming elections. Thank you very much. Now, uh, now we come to Angeliki migration. Uh, we are far away from these images of uh, thousands uh, of uh, people, re refugees and migrants coming to the Greek islands. Uh, we have uh, we had horrible images of what happens on Lesbos and other islands. Not to re uh, let's remember Moria. Where are we now? What I understand is that uh, 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 Greek uh, political parties that used to differ on foreign policy and migration, they are coming together, which is not new to Europe, where, uh, because in Northern Europe, we also have social democrats that on the one hand are very liberal, on the other hand, very restrictive when it comes to migration. Angeliki, please uh, tell us where are we now? Do we expect any changes? Uh, have any problems been resolved uh, uh, or they are just outside of the main, uh, uh, of the main headlines? Thank you, Miriana. Thank you for um, for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to try to address um, all of these issues, um, starting um, a little bit um, in reverse. 
um, looking at how migration is, is, is talked about um, and as a result, what are the issues that are being um, talked about as regards also migration here in Greece, also um, in light of the upcoming elections, what has been addressed, what has not been addressed and how it also plays into the discussion, because as you said, we, we appear to have a little bit of a convergence um, across um, the different political uh, spectrums here in Greece. Migration is a topic that has been fairly salient. In um, and one of the reasons why it has been pushed to the forefront is because it is considered to be one of the areas that the government at least considers itself to be fairly successful. Um, and that has to do with how the reality has changed, especially in relation to 2015, uh, where a consistent comparison is being drawn, but also 2019. The, the first is that the number of arrivals have reduced significantly. Um, from around 70,000 in 2019, we are now at around 18,000 for 2020, which is the last year where we have full figures. The second is that Greece, and, and this is at least, uh, these are public um, figures uh, that I'm utilizing, but um, are not necessarily entirely verified. Um, the government has uh, announced recently that Greece has successfully prevented around 250,000 people from crossing um, from the Greek-Turkish um, land and sea border. Again, I stress these are a little bit unverified numbers and there are a lot of methodological issues with them. But nonetheless, this appeals, of course, um, to, uh, to the voters because it is associated also with um, a sense of, of, of incoming potential threat and, of course, moral panic. The islands in 2019 had around 45,000 um, asylum seekers and vulnerable um, categories. Today, we are at a bit below 4,000. Of course, this has to do also with the overall reduction in numbers, which is worth keeping in mind. And refugee recognition levels have actually increased. We are at a better position now than we were in the period 2015-2019. Around 45% of um, applications are generally um, accepted. And we have finally the new hotspot facilities, especially following the, um, the, the fire in, that destroyed uh, Moria. Uh, those multi-purpose facilities with the assistance and facilitation from the European Commission that are removed also from the urban centers of the islands, which is generally also pleasing to the um, population um, on these islands. Now, this is the reality as it is portrayed also um, by the current government. Um, and to an extent, it is an accurate reality of the situation we have on the ground. On the other hand, what is not being said um, is that arrivals have reduced partly because of the pandemic. I remind that 2020 and 2021, we had border closures, uh, really uh, globally. So we've seen an overall reduction during that period on human mobility, but also due to a consistent policy of what the government labels interceptions, which are often also pushbacks, and combined with the expansion of the border fence. And the border fence is actually in, in Evros, was actually the, the, the place where the current prime minister kicked off his um, election um, campaign. For those that do succeed in entering um, the country, they face de facto detention in the new facilities, limited access to health care. There is a new report that has been released this week that details the lack of doctors. Children play in areas uh, of, with high surveillance and, and surrounded by barbed wire. Schooling is offered in the camp, which means there is no actual integration. Um, and the location of the new facilities is so far removed from the urban centers that also hinders any prospects of integration. Those who are being deemed inadmissible due to the safe third country rule that is still being applied to Turkey. And as a result, we have thousands that have been rejected, but are also not returned to Turkey, which means that they remain in limbo, legal limbo in the country, outside of any uh, protection framework or social assistance. Um, and for those who do receive refugee status, social assistance in the form of housing, employment, and financial aid um, ceases after one month, which means they're left on their own to fend for themselves. Um, we have cases of hunger and extreme poverty amongst uh, recognized refugees. Again, there, today there is another report that is being released on this. There is no actual integration, um, nor an effort really for um, integration. And instead, quietly, Greece is encouraging refugees to seek settlement to other EU member states by cutting off the access to the social services and the social protection mechanisms. Germany is estimated to have around 70,000 recognized refugees and asylum seekers right now that have transited from Greece. So you have two different pictures um, and only one really that is becoming dominant in the public debate with the, the, the 
the opposing side of the reality of how we get to this reality of the reduced numbers um, of the uh, new multipurpose facilities of the limited population on the island, not particularly prevalent in the public discussion. Um, and when it is, it is limited really to, to those who either work on issues of migration or fall under the so-called humanitarian uh, left um, banner. Now, despite the issues that I've mentioned, despite the cost of some of these policies that have been successful uh, in the end in reducing the numbers, migration is not a topic that has been discussed or debated really amongst the opposition parties. Alexandra mentioned the political debate that, well, kind of debate that took place uh, last week amongst the, um, the, the leaders of the different parties. Uh, it's interesting because the only question that was brought up had to do with a border fence. Uh, and it was brought up as a question of whether you would support it or not, which is a very simplified narrative of a fairly complex issue. And what is interesting is that even uh, amongst uh, parties that until basically 2019 had promoted themselves as more uh, humanitarian and um, semi um, even one could say open borders like Syriza, there is a convergence in the fact that the fence should either be maintained um, or potentially even expanded when it comes to the land border, the differentiation really is should we expand the, the fence uh, at the river or not, which is uh, new democracy's uh, preference, that the fence should cover basically the entire land border uh, of Greece uh, with Turkey. So the, the parties are converging um, in a lot of issues when it comes to migration policy. All of them are in support of the EU-Turkey uh, deal, at least the top three parties, so new democracy, Syriza and, and Pasok uh, Kinal, um, in support of the EU-Turkey deal. All three are supportive in different degrees and variations to the border fronts. All three support deportations to Turkey, which is a core component of the EU-Turkey statement. And all three prioritize the new pact as a solution at the European level and seek to uh, advocate for uh, the strong external borders as EU borders. They differentiate on the language they use. and They have always differentiated on the language they've used. Um, but nonetheless, this convergence is something that we have not seen in recent years. Uh, in that sense, it's, it's different and unique uh, in the current um, elections um, that are taking place in a week's time. And I want to close by explaining briefly why I think we're seeing this convergence. There are two aspects to this. The first has to do with the different issues that link with migration. So, for example, pushbacks or interceptions. It's a rule of law issue. And as George highlighted, we have multiple rule of law issues um, that have come about in, in, in Greece, but none of them are prevalent in, in the decisions, um, in the political decisions that the voters are going to make at the election. Um, the second is the issue of social services and social benefits. Uh, and this is an argument that has been raised also by the current government. It is, to an extent, a valid argument. Greeks are also limited in the kind of assistance they can get, which means that if the same level of assistance is provided to refugees for that period of one month, it is it brings them, in theory, at an almost equal level with what is actually available and offered to the Greeks. There are nuances, of course, to this. Huh? Language, for example, which is a key differentiation, understanding how the system works, which, again, recognized refugees don't have any knowledge of. Um, and of course, the overwhelming need for integration support, which uh, exists in most EU member states and Greece continues to, um, to limit. The third is the Greek-Turkish relations. Um, when we talk about migration, since February 2020, and as a result of the Evros incident and the instrumentalization of asylum seekers by Turkey, migration has become really an issue of national security. We don't speak of migration in terms of um, humanitarian issues, in terms of rule of law issues, in terms even of the European framework and obligations. We speak of migration um, as, a national, as a national security threat or as a potentially national security threat, as a hybrid threat. This is a discourse that has dominated the public dialogue here in Greece. Uh, it is something that we've seen uh, a lot also in the media, and it is something that has spilled over also into the political attitudes. So every time migration comes up, the space for a different kind of political discourse is, and, and as a result, um, policy is automatically limited because any alternative scenarios that could be viable and potentially even better in terms of their implementation automatically are contrasted with 
um, are, or are presented as a so-called open border policy, um, which risks um, further instrumentalization from Turkey and, 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 and the national security, basically, of the country. So this automatically limits the space um, of having different policies proposed um, and facilitates the convergence on the issues. Thank you very much, Angeliki. Just a short, uh, uh, I wrote, uh, please prepare your questions, raise your hand and turn on your camera. I have a, just a follow up uh, question. You mentioned that the parties converge, but there is a different language they use. Could you just give us example of the language used? Um, I think the, la the, the different language has to do, first of all, with how migrants are portrayed and how they're spoken of. Um, of course, the more uh, centrist and left-wing parties always undertake a, um, a more humane and um, less biased, I would say, um, language towards migration. They don't portray it as uh, necessarily um, a threat or um, an issue area of, of national security per se, but they have also become a bit more conservative um, in how they talk about irregular entries, uh, the management of um, irregular migrants, who is a refugee. This is a, an issue that we didn't have really in 2015, but suddenly we do have this differentiation who is a refugee and who is a migrant. Uh, and what should we be doing with the irregular migrants? And that's why I came back to the EU Turkey statement. Um, it's interesting, for example, I was I was watching uh, yesterday, I, I, I genuinely don't remember which channel, but uh, the former minister of migration from Syriza, Mr. Muzalas, was, was on. And he said, we think there is a political solution to irregular migration, and that is the EU Turkey statement, which we have proudly basically um, been the principal lead on, because at the time, obviously, they were the government. Now, for me as a researcher working on this issue, this is very interesting because there were a lot of problems with the implementation of the EU Turkey statement. And there are still a lot of issues with the implementation. And one of them has to do with the returns to Turkey, which we label as a safe third country. But it is highly debatable whether that classification is valid today and has been valid for the last at least two or three years. Um, and in light of the potential return of more than one million Syrians, for example, to save zones. Um, and yet, this is not something that is touched upon at all. And there, I, I, there you can draw a direct convergence also with the current government's um, attitude that irregular migrants uh, or rejected um, asylum um, applicants should basically be deported, whether to Turkey or to their countries of origin. It varies, but they converge on deportation. They, they shift a little bit in how they talk about it. Thank you. I was actually thinking of something else. I was thinking of hate speech. Is it allowed to be racist? Is it? Uh, is the? Uh, uh, I was thinking of that more. Um... Um, no, uh, but I think what's interesting, and 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 George and Alexandra um, may may have more insights on this. But I think what's interesting in in the political parties right now that we have in Greece is that they seem to have. Uh, multiple voices reflected um, in them in how they touch on, on, on different issues and especially on migration. So you're not going to have, uh, with the exception obviously of far right parties, but I'm not talking about the far right parties because they're an exceptionality in any case. Um, from the mainstream parties, you're not going to have hate speech, um, but what you will have is language that can criminalize, for example, migrants. Um, so we are seeing a return to the what translates into Greece uh, illegal migrants, for example, which had stopped um, for a while. But this is not unique to Greece. This is reflective of the broader European shift, because we're, a lot of the things that are happening in Greece on migration and on the political level, we're seeing reflected across multiple EU member states. So Greece and that is not unique. That's true. <laughs> Greece is not unique. Are there any questions or shall I uh, ask uh, questions? Do I see any questions? Uh, Diego Saez, please uh, turn on the camera and go ahead and please introduce yourself. Wait, okay. Can you listen to me? Yes, please. Okay. Yes. Uh, my name is Diego Saez. I'm a journalist for the International Spanish News Agency, uh, Agencia EFE. Uh, I have uh, two questions. Uh, to Mr. Siakas that uh, we spoke and uh, I don't know if he remembers me for another issue, the fragmentation of the 
of the Greek left, let's say. Uh, so, um, uh, first, a technical question. Uh, all the uh, all the data that you showed in your presentation were from this from the from the um, Macedonia University study. Uh, uh, well, uh, the the data from various opinion polls that were conducted by us. Uh, so I... the, uh, the the they were commissioned by other institutions, but they were carried out by us. So we are the data provider. The University of Macedonia. The Public Opinion Research Unit of the University of Macedonia Research Institute. It's a bit long, but it's accurate. Okay, okay. And that includes the um, um, the poll about uh, what concerns more the the Greek public opinion, the, the economy, the inflation, and, and yeah. that, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. So um, my first question is: um, um, it has to do with uh, the political the political context of this of this election. And I would like to ask you if you said that uh, what concerns more the Greeks in these elections is the economy for various reasons. Uh, and I want you, and I wanted you to ask you it, it's it is not um, understandable that the economy is what concerns more the Greek people after ten years of uh, of it, maybe the the harshest uh, and uh, and the harshest uh, economic crisis a European country has seen in history in modern history at least. Thank you. Uh, uh, should I, Megana, should I go on? Yes. Uh, uh, do you have a second question? Can you say it now and then? Yes. Uh... And the second question, uh, yes, yes, of course. And the second question has to be with the, with the extreme left and the extreme uh, right in Greece. Uh, because um, we can see that uh, in these elections, let's say if the extreme right is not going to get uh, any representation uh, because Kassidiaris party was um, um, was prohibited, uh, although according to polls, it would uh, get into the parliament if if it was allowed to run. So I would I would like uh, my question is um, even though is it not in the headlines because they will not get political representation and stuff like that, is still the extreme right and the extreme left um, they have uh, power in Greece. They have people. Thank you very uh, much, please. Diego. Please, uh, George. Great. I, I will. I will. I will start with the second question, which is more, um, w which is one of the my, my favorites. So, um, what uh, uh, what public opinion polls uh, uh, t tell us, but we haven't uh, given the, uh, the the proper amount of uh, exposure uh, right now, is that we have a great amount of undecided voters. We have about twenty percent of undecided voters now. Now. It's it's a very it's a it's an enormous amount uh, one week before the elections. It's an enormous amount. Um, so wh what does that mean? That means that uh, probably uh, did, did, th that means that there, there is a potential for a new for an uh, upcoming power of, of a party that could be represented in the in the parliament. I don't think so to be to be honest because it seems that this uh, this area is. Scattered, and there is not a prominent figure like uh, Kassidiaris, for example, that could concentrate uh, three percent in order to be rep represented. But there is there, there is an amount of people that claim that they are undecided. In my understanding, the majority of these people uh, will abstain; they will not uh, gonna vote. So, so I believe, and I give more. Um, uh, the, the probability is more than. Uh, than the other scenario. I mean, the probability of not having an expression of this, of this standing far right or far left power into the parliament. This is what I believe. In order, I, I'm also tempted to make a projection. I think that we will have the same parliament, I mean, in terms of the uh, balance of power as we had in 2019. This is among the lines the response to the second question. Regarding the first question, to be honest, I don't know uh, where the equilibrium lies. I mean, okay, one one argument is that uh, after the crisis, uh, we, the, the economy is a major concern. But actually, we don't know if this is an effect of the of the discourse that the party uh, provide, or it is an effect of the daily life, um, uh, let's say, issues that everyone faces. We don't know that actually. Because 
it is an it is economy in total but what is economy about is it macroeconomics is it is it the fact that we have 200 percent of uh, public debt and we are in the realm of uh, going again into mou is it is the issue that we don't have opportunities and the life cost is extremely high we don't know we do not know that to be to be absolutely honest and uh, if i may try also to provide a question and also respond to that question is that uh, uh, I'm also attempting to, to give a, a pr prediction that uh, the, uh, the issue with the economy after the elections and after one or two years after the election will be very harsh. And I'm expecting things to be even worse in the economic terms. Thank you very much. Uh, any other questions or uh, I have uh, uh, two. Well, I don't see. Uh, then uh, I have a question for you, George, and uh, I have for you, Angelique, as well. To you, George, is I read about police brutality in Greece. Is that a concern? And to you, and Angelique, uh, is Greece foreseeing that any of these refugee seekers and migrants will stay in Greece? Are there any measures to integrate them or they'll be just left in the street to be hungry and not have social services? First you, George, and then you, Angeliki. Uh, I don't think that uh, police brutality is an issue. I don't think that it's, uh, it monopolizes or it is even uh, present in the, in the agenda, in the political agenda. I mean, we don't have discussions, discussions as uh, reformations, reforms in the police, uh, changes in the way it attitudes. We don't have uh, this, uh, this issue. Um, in, uh, in past years, we had an issue of um, of police officers wearing uh, cameras in their uniforms, but this was not a, a concrete dialogue that uh, could, uh, could could be transformed into policy initiatives. We don't have these issues. Um, police brutality is merely a scattered issue in the agenda, and it occurs when we have major events. Uh, this is my, uh, my my opinion towards this issue. Thank you, Angeliki. Um. Integration is um, is not a priority, but it has never really been a priority. What is interesting, however, is that Greece is recognizing that it has a demographic issue. The, the, risk, the recent um, data that has been released um, shows that the population is um, slightly declining, and the prediction is that that decline will continue, which means, and it's already facing shortages of, of labor. Um, in in key areas, especially the tourist industry, but not just tourism, agriculture also. Uh, so what's interesting is that on the one hand, we don't really have any efforts to integrate um, those that remain in the country, um, but there is now a discussion about how to bring foreign um, workers um, from countries like Bangladesh or Pakistan, which have a traditionally, at least in the last 20 years, a significant presence um, in, in, in Greece, predominantly through irregular migration. So how to bring in, how to establish circular migration routes, basically, and bring in a, a, under quota schemes, a specific number of, of, of working um, hands. And I say it's interesting because it gives you also um, an indication of, of how migration is really approached. It is fine to choose whom to bring in and for how long to regulate it, um, make it legal, but to regulate and restrict for how long they will stay in the country. Whereas when we talk about integration, it really is about um, allowing a number of people that have been have entered irregularly but have gone through the asylum process and have been and have received protection to stay. The first group is not really um, is not necessarily, I think, perceived as a useful one um, for um, for the economy. Um, and precisely because no selection process has taken place in advance. Um, there is a preference more towards legal migration routes rather than integrating those who have remained. The, the second aspect is um, what I said to you before. It has to do with the economy and also access to social uh, benefits that are also not available for the Greeks. Keep in mind, for example, we don't have social housing in Greece. If we don't have social housing in Greece for, for Greeks who are facing um, poverty, um, low income, 
how are we going to have social housing for refugees and migrants? I uh, come to you, Alexandra, and the question is semi-foreign policy and not quite. Uh, when I hear Georg speak about the general situation and the Greek context, I wonder to what extent Greeks are migrating. Do you have uh, any uh, figures or they just say, well, this is what the world is like. You know, even my generation, I remember a lot of great uh, the, uh, diaspora in the United States and other countries where I lived it was huge. Uh, is it continuing to grow How, <laughs> or, you know, people are just uh, sort of uh, saying, well, this is what Greece, are like, uh, Greece is like and we are staying. Sorry, is this a question for me, Mariana? Yes, yes. I don't have any numbers. Maybe Professor Siakas have uh, numbers regarding uh, migration. However, from my personal experience here in Brussels, I mean, I'm, people are telling me, and I can hear young people talking in the streets of Brussels in Greek, that many uh, Greek youngsters are leaving still leaving the country. They don't see any prospects and um, the wage and the incomes are not satisfied. That's that's why they are leaving. So from my personal experience, I can see that uh, many green, Greek young people are already moving and most of them are already here and are seeking jobs and opportunities, uh, not only in the European institutions, but in general, uh, out of uh, Greece, and this is worrying some, but I don't have numbers. No, that's all right. Do you have George any numbers? I don't have the actual numbers, but the brain drain is an issue here. We have qualified the young people that are trying to to make their life abroad, and that's a real issue. Um, that's a, that's a very uh, uh, disorganizing issue of uh, people that study in Greece uh, that. Uh, should have been in Greece and all dedicate their powers for the better of the future of their own or the, the country. They leave the country, they go outside, and they get the, the chances they deserve. And the problem is that we have we have an, um, a low level opportunity framework in in Greece. That's an issue. But do you see any way of breaking that system? Because it's a little bit of a fatality. And when I listen to you, George, it's all sort of uh, uh, gloom and doom. Is there any way of breaking that system or uh, not that, now? That, that, of course there is. I, I mean, of course, th this is also an, another story. It's, uh, we, we should dedicate another meeting for, uh, for discussing this issue and also bring some other experts of uh, development and uh, how you can construct uh, an economy or a country that also has to raise issues like values, uh, like uh, uh, structures, uh, like uh, mobility. Um, there, there are many, many ways to fix that. I mean, we are not the only country that faced these problems. There have been also plenty of other and, and, and probably more significant and uh, crucial issues in the past in other experiences. Of course, there are, there are ways to do that. Um, when you when you react to this uh, in uh, in a way of uh, seeing that as a fatality, yeah, this is a problem. Well, uh, I, I don't know if I if I if I was uh, so futile in uh, in my in my in, in my effort to describe uh, what the current trends are, uh, but uh, I think that uh, when you when when you see people, when you see the things as they are in a very uh, in a very Cold way in a cold-blooded way. It's a better and it's a better way to to take measures to to fix them. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I don't see any. Uh, uh, I'm the only one asking questions. Well, I I'll come back to you, Alexandra. Uh, there is more and more talk about the normalization of the war. What I mean that the war in Ukraine will last at least this year. I mean, I I cannot foresee. Uh, uh, my question is. What do you think will be the impact on Greece in particular if the war uh, uh, drags on, if, if it continues, uh, uh, as it seems it will continue? Uh, well, Mariana, first of all, um, since we're going back to uh, the war in Ukraine and we discussed in the first part 
uh, how uh, opinion polls are missing. I would like to add to what Professor Siaka said that, yes, the Greek citizens are aligned with the West, with the European Union. However, I have um, an assumption that they are aligned with the West and the EU, uh, in this case of the war in Ukraine, uh, but not as uh, in, uh, in an innocent, let's, wait, uh, let's say, way. Um, they uh, see, they've seen, the Greek citizens, this cooperation between Turkey and Russia, between Erdogan and Putin, as a coalition and cooperation against their own uh, Greece's interests. That was the narrative, let's say, uh, of the ruling party, of the government, and of the mainstream media. And maybe, I suppose, that the Greek citizens are aligned with the EU and the West in because of that fact, that might explain why they're uh, by a very high percentage uh, in favor of uh, the UN alignment, but I'm not sure whether they are still aligned with uh, sanctions and the war going on, dragging on forever. I mean, uh, Professor Siakas explained that we don't measure anymore the public opinion because uh, the war is something that it's still going on with no uh, big, let's say, uh, developments. Regarding uh, Greece's foreign policy, as I said, uh, there will be a change if we have a change uh, in the government. I mean, uh, a progressive, let's say, coalition government will stop sending ammunition and uh, armaments. Um, if the ruling party, New Democracy, uh, forms a majority government again, in July, uh, we haven't explained um, the, the two scenarios and the two elections. I mean, nobody's really certain that we'll have uh, a government in May. So the most probable scenario will be that we will have a government in July. If we have a majority government uh, by a new democracy, uh, nothing will really uh, change. And I think we have promised certain uh, amounts of ammunition to be sent uh, to Ukraine. Um, having uh, said that, uh, I think that we should focus more uh, also on the public trends regarding the war. I mean, I would be interesting to see whether the Greeks are in favor of um, any concessions or negotiations that would also include um, Ukraine losing territory, uh, because there have been similar questions in polls in other EU member states very uh, recently. I think Italy has made a difference comparing to other EU member states. And I'm always amazed that even in European uh, polls, Greece is not measured or numbered in uh, uh, European opinion polls regarding the war in Ukraine, since it is very well known that Greece had always had uh, traditional uh, ties and relations with Russia. And there is certain uh, influence of Russia in the media um, and uh, at the beginning of the war, if you remember, there has been a very uh, unprecedented intervention by the Russian embassy uh, in Athens, uh, only in Athens and in Sofia, there have been strong reactions against the governments and the political parties to stand because of this, their stance towards the war. So uh, many things are missing regarding the war here. Uh, obviously, it's not a, an issue that we will discuss, but as I mentioned before, we don't even discuss about Europe, the European Union, and how it is been transforming. I mean, um, but are we discussing corruption, uh, 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 corruption and Qatar gates in the uh, European Parliament where Greek uh, <laughs> is involved, or even that is not uh, an issue? It is uh, obviously an issue, uh, Miriana, and I would be interested to see uh, how uh, Greek citizens see the European Union um, in the shadows of the scandal regarding the target. Because, because as I imagine it, for the average Greek citizen, the EU uh, is not separated. Uh, what ha whatever happens at the European Parliament uh, overshadows general the image of uh, the European Union. So um, in the next few months, it would be really interesting to see the impact of this uh, scandal, let's say, to uh, the average Greek uh, voter. But how do, uh, how do media uh, discuss this uh, scandal? 
Uh, at the beginning, the, I mean, when uh, we actually heard about it in December, there was uh, a great interest, and not only by the Greek media, but also um, from the international media. But uh, as it is evolving, and people are already out of jail, of course, under surveillance, but uh, as we are hearing uh, here in Brussels, um, uh, the investigation is already ongoing. Um, there is no much talk about it, and it's like as if the, um, uh, even the political uh, groups uh, here in the European institutions are not seeking to further investigate themselves what has happened. I, I do remember, for instance, that the Social Democrats here in the European Parliament would have initiated an investigation, uh, an, uh, an internal investigation, because Mostly Qatar Gate scandal involved uh, Social Democrats MEPs, but nothing has happened since uh, their declaration that will, they will also investigate it. And I'm, I'm afraid that um, investigations are still going on and there is no much interest by other political groups because of fear or concern that other scandals may erupt so, and that will involve uh, MEPs uh, or other officials from other uh, political groups. Thank you very much. And before I close, I have one. Uh, I, I'm really curious. Of, uh, it's just one question that is. I, I'm not sure how to place it. Uh, during the uh, during the uh, financial crisis in Greece, Yamis Varoufakis was like a rock star in Europe. Uh, he was everywhere. Uh, when he came to Vienna. Uh, his uh, speech was uh, there wasn't enough room to sit all the people at the huge uh, amphitheater at the Faculty of Economics. Uh, they had to have live streaming. Where is he today? What happened with the rock star uh, role? Uh, who will reply that? George? Uh, <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, great question. I think that uh, he is uh, still a persona. I don't know if the um, actual description is uh, like a rock star, but it's it's a persona. Uh, he 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 also uh, cultivates that. He he tries to to provide uh, his uh, his attributes more than uh, his policies, for example. Um, in the political terms, what he he's trying to do in Greece is to provide an anti-establishment rhetoric. So what he's trying to do is that he's trying to uh, to lower the gap between the elites and the normal people, but by changing the system. This is uh, either an anti-systemic approach. A systemic approach means that you're trying to, de to destroy the system. For example, destroy capitalism, uh, destroy the current currency, um, make something parallel. This is anti-systemic. Or other people believe he's an anti-establishment actor, that he's trying to, to provide this kind of rhetoric in order to, to, to rise the barrier, uh, in order to make some reform, to, 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 to uh, proceed to some reform that would eventually change the current balance. Uh, in my understanding, this is um, a political market approach. He's trying to do that in order to gain followers. Uh, he has uh, societal values that resemble the left values, and also he has economic values that also uh, resemble uh, far right and far uh, left uh, policies. This is an anti-systemic uh, approach. He's a star. He's a persona, yes. I don't know if he's a rock star or a pop star or a football player, but he's a star, uh, definitely. <laughs> well... Since there are no questions, I want to thank all of you. Uh, I think this was a great context uh, that you have provided us uh, for to understand Greece a bit more. Uh, it reminds me that, that, unfortunately, I don't remember the name. There is this famous Greek crime writer, and I remember one of his novels that I read where uh, the main uh, uh, character, he's... Uh, I think uh, a detective and his daughter meets a, a, meets a doctor 
and he loves his future son-in-law, but hell comes. He is a doctor and he doesn't take bribes. So he doesn't really understand this uh, new son-in-law. But at the end, the son-in-law convinces him that there is a possibility to be a doctor in Greece and not to uh, take bribes. So let's hope that uh, a different reality is possible. <laughs> and I thank you all for your great contribution. and. Uh, uh, we shall uh, distribute this video for all of those who will be uh, covering the election. This is really fantastic context. I thank you so much. Sabine? Yeah, many thanks also from my side. It was really very interesting. I just want to say the forecast is already out, so I published a link to the Greek chapter for those who are interested and also to the general press release. Yeah, and I hope we get together again and this, this discuss further. Yeah, many thanks and all the best. Thank you. Parakalo. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for Thank the invitation. You. You. And the writer is Petros Markaris, I think. Yes. Miriana. The writer. I'm sorry? It's, Pe it's Petros Markaris. Oh, Petros Markaris. That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. I remember Thank the you, Mariana. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.